From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS 12 exchanges and six clearinghouses around the world. And now welcome inside the ICE house. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. You've heard us invoke the name Jay Clayton many times on this podcast. He's our chief regulator, the 32nd chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission, the independent agency with the three-part mission to protect investors, maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and facilitate capital formation. The SEC was formed in 1934, 85 years ago, created by the Securities and Exchange Act, signed into law by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. There was this crash, you remember, five years before that, 1929, which sent this building into a tailspin. And you know the rest of the story. The Great Depression followed. The man FDR would tap to lead the SEC, its first chairman, was 46-year-old Joseph P. Kennedy Jr., a renowned businessman and fundraiser for the president who would go on, four years later, to become the U.S. ambassador to the Court of St. James's, our man in London, at a pivotal time in world history. Ambassador Kennedy famously, or infamously, sided with British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain on a policy of appeasement toward Berlin. Shortly before the German bombing of Britain began in September 1940, Kennedy sought a personal meeting with Adolf Hitler to, as he wrote, bring about a better understanding between the United States and Germany. In an interview with the reporters for the Boston Globe, he said at the time, I know more about the European situation than anybody else, and it's up to me to see that this country gets it. Hmm. Diplomacy which has been around since the Italian Renaissance, designed to share information among nation-states for the primary purpose of fostering peace, is in much demand today, as it was during the Italian wars of the Habsburg Valois. But sometimes it's in short supply. The former Defense Secretary James Mattis said in 2013 that, as a quote, if you don't fund the State Department fully, then I need to buy more ammunition, ultimately. And we've seen that prophecy play out time and again. With each new administration, our president has the duty of appointing our ambassadors, who are then confirmed by the United States Senate. As we saw in 1940, and as we see today in the still unfolding story around Ukraine, the job of diplomat has sometimes been fraught. But for thousands of others who've held that rank, it's an honor unlike any other to present the credentials of our nation to a foreign head of state, and represent our interests overseas. Today, a conversation with one of them, Ambassador John B. Emerson, our man in Berlin from 2013 to 2017, and now vice chairman of Capital Group International, the firm he left to take up his diplomatic post. On serving a country at home and abroad, on advancing peace and promoting commercial cooperation, and ultimately on coming home. Our conversation with John Emerson, right after this. And now a word from John Van Sicklen, CEO of Dynatrace, NYSE ticker DT. We're a software intelligence company for the enterprise cloud. Software rules the world and we bring performance and intelligence to those who develop, operate, and drive business outcomes for the digital age. We sell our products in 70 different countries. Many of our customers trade on the NYSE. It is the enterprise class customer base that we target, and we're thrilled to be part of the family. Dynatrace is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. The Brits have a deal to leave Europe. The Turks have an opening to enter Syria. The Ukrainians got a request to do the Americans a favor. And the invitation to the G7 leaders to spend next June in Doral, in Miami, seems up in the air. It's enough to make a diplomat's head spin. 
The stakes may not seem as immediately fraught as when Joe Kennedy made his residence in Winfield House in London from 1938 to 1940, but any man or woman dispatched overseas these days to represent United States interests has a juggling act to manage relationships between his or her host government and those in Washington. Joining us in the Ice House today is a man who spent four years in Berlin overseeing the operations at our embassy at Pariser Platz No. 2. John Emerson, who I got to know as a friend working in the White House in the 1990s, was happily back in Los Angeles, California, as the president of Capital Group Private Client Services when he was named by President Obama as our ambassador to Germany and confirmed by the Senate to succeed Phil Murphy, now the governor of New Jersey. After four years on post, John and his family returned to L.A., where he's now vice chairman of Capital Group International. Ambassador Emerson, welcome to the New York Stock Exchange, and welcome inside the Ice House. Hey, thanks so much, Josh. It's great to be here, and it's great to see you again. Good to see you, too. You and I were talking. You haven't been in this building since you were a kid. No, I remember coming here when I went to... um I grew up in and around New York, uh, went to elementary school in Bloomfield, New Jersey, junior high and high school in Mamaroneck, New York, and uh, probably in elementary school. I remember we took a, a tour and came in and saw the uh, saw Wall Street, saw the stock exchange. Very exciting thing. But it's amazing. I have not been here since then. So what brings you back to New York on this trip? Well, you know, I spend uh, in my role with Capital Now, I probably spend about a third of my time overseas and the balance of my time split between our headquarters in Los Angeles and places uh, like New York and Florida and Washington, Chicago, other places where we have where we have clients talking about geopolitics. You know, it's an interesting time in the investment world where I think a lot of folks would say that probably more than at any time in their investing history, people are concerned about, interested in geopolitics and just geostrategically what's happening around the world, what's likely to happen. Obviously, if you look at the ups and downs of the market in the last couple of years, probably the ups and downs of our trade negotiations have tracked what's been happening in the market or vice versa. And so there's a lot of interest, a lot of concern. I was interested in your the, the four issues that you picked on. Ukraine, I was serving when Russia illegally annexed uh, Crimea and in, invaded Ukraine, in effect, with the Donbass and supporting the separatists. Angela Merkel played a principal role in trying to navigate a diplomatic solution to that. I ended up traveling to Kiev a couple of times with my counterpart there, a guy named Jeff Pyatt, who was the uh, ambassador there. You mentioned Brexit. I was in Germany when the Brexit vote took place. There was enormous distress because people feared this was the first brick out of the wall of European integration. And you mentioned the G7. We had the uh, G7 hosted in Germany in, uh, in 2015. And that was a, a, a great experience for an ambassador to welcome the president to that country and be, be a part of that whole effort as well. So lots to talk about. Lots to talk about. And the cycles sort of keep repeating in interesting ways. An ambassador knows the calendar is so much dictated by these gatherings of world leaders, whether you're in the G7 cycle or in the APEC cycle, and then there's the EU summit cycle. Last week, there was the EU summit in Brussels. The headlines across the pond this week are Brexit exposes EU power struggle as Emmanuel Macron and Angela Merkel pull in opposite directions. Who wins that tug of war, John? Well, it's interesting. Clearly, Angela Merkel is at most has another two years Assuming the coalition government holds in Germany, which is not a foregone conclusion, she would be continuous chancellor until after the elections in September of 2021. But if the governing coalition doesn't hold, and right now the Social Democrats, who are, are her party's coalition partner, are involved in a leadership battle, a leadership struggle. There's seven teams of candidates running. They do a male-female team thing here. And only one of them, the one led by Olaf Scholz, who's currently the vice chancellor and the finance minister of Germany, has uh, committed to stick with the coalition for that remaining two years. If the Social Democrats decide to pull out of the coalition as a result of that leadership struggle, which will be resolved sometime in early December, uh, we could see new elections in Germany in uh, January or February. The, the chancellor 
clearly has the ability to continue governing a minority government, but all indications are that she would not do that and that we would have new elections. So so you got to give uh, Macron a little bit of an edge there since uh, he's clearly going to be around for uh, for longer than that. So you and I follow each other on social media. I know there was a certain wistfulness when you and Kimberly packed your bags to return from L.A. Even after a long career of so many milestones that we're going to get into, John, those years between 2013 and 2017 seem like a singular highlight. Uh, no question about it. On, on every level. First of all, substantively, it was clearly the most uh, I- interesting thing that I did. I was lucky to be ambassador to Germany during a time when because of the fact that David Cameron was tied up with Brexit, Francois Hollande was struggling politically, Italy was changing prime ministers, it felt like every two or three months, and Spain didn't have a government for a year and a half. Pretty much everything that was in our international economic interest and our national security interest as it related to NATO, the EU, often Middle East, North Africa, all roads led through Angela Merkel, and and in particular the role that she played uh, both in the Ukraine situation and as we were trying to negotiate the TTIP trade agreement. Uh, And I had an opportunity to be deeply involved in that as well. So substantively, it was fascinating. We have 35,000 troops, American troops in Germany, the uh, USER, U.S. Army Europe, and USAFE, U.S. Air Force Europe, are headquartered in Wiesbaden and Ramstein, respectively. And of course, we have EURCOM and AFRICOM in Stuttgart. So uh, a great deal of work um, with the men and women in uh, in armed services and with particularly the combatant commanders and the leadership there. And then, you know, on the fun stuff, I mean, as your ambassador to... uh, any country, particularly the American ambassador, I always say it's an excuse to meet the most interesting people in that country and the most interesting uh, Americans that may come to visit, whether they're members of Congress, Supreme Court justices, people who are coming over to shoot movies. Speaking of that, John, season five of Homeland, which aired on Showtime, which is NYSE ticker symbol CBS, it aired from October to December 2015, smack in the middle of your posting to Berlin with much of the action depicted in a city that historically borders east and west. Want to hear a little clip? Season five. We are in Germany, in Berlin. Berlin has a really rich culture of espionage. It just is a fit, and I can't quite believe we haven't worked here before. We have great German partners at Babelsberg Studio, which is the oldest studio. It's where they filmed Metropolis. So that's Mandy Patenkin, Claire Danes, F. Murray Abraham, along with the executive producer, Leslie Linka Glader, the show's executive producer. Did that add an element of intrigue to your friends back home wondering if the sitting ambassador would have a cameo? Well, well, first of all, all of those people ended up coming to our house for dinner. Leslie uh, Linka Glader, in fact, became a good friend, and we're going to a play on uh, uh, this weekend that my daughter's in together. So a couple of things about that. First of all, I, I think Leslie contacted me through a mutual friend who said, oh, they're coming over. Now, Kimberly and I, my wife and I, are huge fans of Homeland. So actually, we were pretty excited to hear this. So we brought them into the embassy, introduced them to some folks. They were interested, the, including the costume people and the set designers, to sort of walk around. How do people dress? How do they interact? How do they, how do they relate to one another? And then shortly after they got there, I put together a dinner at our residence with the writers, directors, and lead actors of Homeland, and the people they pretend to be in my embassy. And obviously, we got all the approvals. I'm not sure who had more fun, members of our station in the embassy, our intelligence community, or the folks with Homeland. But that that party went till about two in the morning. And then another funny story, we obviously visited the set, but Shortly uh, at, before the end of the show, and we'd, we'd gotten it, we've worked closely with Babelsberg Film Studios as well on a number of things. Uh, but shortly before the end, we'd gotten so close to everybody there that we um, basically had a party at our house. It was a seated dinner for about 60 people, the cast and the crew. You know, it wasn't their wrap party, they had that separately, but it turned out to be on Halloween. And I remember Kimberly and I saying, as the guests were about to arrive, it's like, 
you know, we didn't really build this as a costume party, but it's Halloween. What, what do we do? So Kimberly threw on a dirndl, which, you know, you think about Oktoberfest. And I threw on one of those jackets with the bones and, you know, the bone uh, uh, buttons and, sound and of the music hat. Looking, you know, right? Sound of music looking look. And we got in there and then it was sort of, what idiots are we? These are people who actually work with a professional makeup crew. So one guy came as a, a, you know, a, as a zombie. I thought I was going to get sick to my stomach. I mean, it was like so nauseating, brains oozing out of his head. Somebody else, you know, I, I mean, Claire Danes and her husband, Hugh Dancy, came as uh, he was a mad scientist. She was a witch. I mean, pe- but I mean, fully, fully, fully made up. It was, it was fantastic and a lot of fun. And there were a lot of toasts. And one of the toasts I gave was I said, you know, We've been incredibly gracious to you guys, and and I got but I got a bone to pick. I said you you actually as part of your plot this year you had them f- kick out the American ambassador to Germany. I said, what are you trying to give Merkel ideas? I mean, why are you doing that? Anyway, it was a lot of fun. But even with that, so many people who are connected culturally or through film and books and history with Berlin associate it with a time long ago. And these episodes brought us front and center with modern Berlin. Did you find that it was actually helping people understand where Germany sits in the modern economy and modern military establishment? I think it probably did, because the fact of the matter is our intelligence services work extremely closely together on counterterrorism issues, on dealing with, you know, there's some countries where Germany has more insight and better, uh, you know, relations than, than we do, and that can be enormously helpful. And the, my entire, from soup to nuts, my entire career over there was involved in the intelligence community. And you, you may not remember this, in, you'll remember the incident, you may not remember it was me, but six weeks after I got there, news broke oh, yeah. that we had been tapping Angela's Merkel's cell phone, yep. allegedly. And this was a massive, the technical term was shitstorm in Germany, because you have a country with 50 years of the Third Reich and the Stasi using intelligence gathering to really control the populace. Uh, It's a very, very sensitive issue. You know, the chancellor does not get a president's daily brief from the intelligence community the way our president does, first meeting every day, as you know. And the IC doesn't report directly to her. It reports either to her national security advisor or her chief of staff. There's a, a level of sort of given the Heisman to the community. So when this thing broke, it was uh, explosive internally. It was something we had to deal with in terms of trying to not only rebuild trust between our two countries, but rebuild the working relationship between our intelligence community and the German intelligence community. And uh, it's a good thing we did because there were multiple instances where because of that work, we were able to thwart terror attacks, not just uh, in Europe, but on German soil as well. I mean, Der Spiegel wrote at the time, and I'm going to quote, German Foreign Minister Guido Westervel on Thursday took the unusual step of summoning the American ambassador to Germany to an afternoon meeting in Berlin in the wake of reports that the U.S. might have spied on Chancellor Angela Merkel's cell phone. John, you've just been confirmed. You've just moved your family over to Berlin. You're expecting maybe more of the fun stuff than the tough stuff, and you are summoned to meet with the foreign minister. I mean, you've had a lot of experience in diplomatic type activities, but this is this is the major leagues. Well, you know, it was you say fun stuff, tough stuff. I actually picked Germany in part because I wanted I thought it would be one of the most interesting places. I certainly didn't hope or expect that I would have to deal with that kind of crisis so early in my tenure. But, you know, it was a situation. I was the first ambassador since the Second World War to be convoked, which is when you basically when the government, your host government yells at you for one reason or another. And um, it, it was very interesting. So the the meeting with with uh, Vesterville, who I had already had several meetings with, even in just that six week period of time, uh, was interesting. He started out and he said, Dear John, I need to address you as ambassador. And uh, and then it was just sort of bam, bam, bam. And then after about 10 minutes of this, and, and my response was, I will communicate. You don't apologize. You don't admit. Just, I will communicate that back to the government. I understand the concern. These are steps that we're, uh, you know, that we're beginning to take. But then he just sort of sighed and he said, "Okay, let's talk about how we're going to fix this." So it was even in that context, it was much more of a two people who care deeply about the transatlantic relationship and and how do we go about 
fixing this and rebuilding it. And um, it was interesting. The State Department was not too helpful. They sent me a cable that said, well, what you should do is say, I'm sorry, we don't comment on intelligence matters. I can see that cable being drafted right now. Yeah. So I promptly ripped it up. And this is one of the advantages that non-career ambassadors have. You're a little less concerned about, am I going to piss somebody off who's going to be sitting on my review committee at the State Department? And I knew for sure that one reason the president of the United States put me there was for my judgment on how to deal with these kinds of unanticipated situations that come up. So I chose to go out in the in the public and, and took a very public role on this, which effectively was allowing people to unload on me, responding that I understood, fully understood, and, and letting them through my response know that I understood, and then trying to elevate the conversation back to why it's so important that we continue to work together. And I did that all over the country for uh, a, a period of time. I, I was One of the biggest honors I received was um, when I left, the day... Before I left, I got a call from our station chief, and he asked me to you know, come to there, which is unusual, because usually they would come to me as ambassador, come down to the floor where they were, and I walk in, and there's a number of people you know, gathered there, and they all start applauding, and he presented me with the CIA medal, which is the highest civilian honor uh, that the CIA can give, and, uh, and it was for standing up for and defending the intelligence community during a time of great distress. And uh, I'll tell you, that meant a lot to me. So, John, talking about how you've been able to hone your judgment on unexpected situations that come up, I want to take you back 25 years. January 17th, 1994. Let's hear from Tom Brokaw of NBC News. Nightly News with Tom Brokaw, reporting tonight from Southern California. Good evening from the San Fernando Valley, where night is beginning to settle in after what has been a very long day. All of Southern California still is reeling from that major earthquake that struck at 4.30 Pacific time this morning in Northridge in the San Fernando Valley, a heavily populated area just northwest of downtown Los Angeles. The quake was severe at 6.6 on the Richter scale. The damage extensive, including five major highways cut, water supplies threatened, gas mains exploding, a half dozen communities in flames. The death toll has been going up all day long. So, John, you are still relatively new in the White House, as am I. Disaster strikes on that January morning. How do you and the federal government and the state government respond? Well, it was, uh, it, it was, what your listeners may not know is that I, not only it's from California, but I had run the Clinton campaign in California in 1992. It was the first uh, year since, uh, actually since LBJ's landslide that California went Democratic as opposed to Republican. And it was an essential win for him if he was going to win the presidency. So, but this was my home. Los Angeles was my home. It happened at about 7.30 in the morning. It was Martin Luther King Day. Uh, I think my wife got the news first, and it was two things. Number one, quickly calling family to make sure uh, that they're okay. Fortunately, we were able to get through to to her mother. And then I immediately went into the White House, and I immediately went down to the Oval Office. And um, I remember the president was there with Dee Dee Myers and and George Stephanopoulos and, and a couple of other people. James Lee Witt, the head of FEMA, came in, and then within three hours... I was on an Air Force jet with, uh, with, with Witt, with Henry Cisneros, who was the Secretary of HUD, and with Federico Pena, who was the Secretary of Transportation, and, and the four of us were heading out to Los Angeles. And uh, so we literally were on the ground that night. These were the days when California felt like it was, you know, the day of the locust. Uh, they had just had fires. They'd had floods. FEMA already had a... Um, operation center set up in Pasadena, California, because there had been uh, terrible fires, a lot of homes destroyed in the hills above Pasadena. And so we immediately went there. I remember that first night there were three aftershocks, each one of which was greater than a 5.0. And you feel those, uh, even, even for us experienced Southern Californians. I mean, it was an extraordinary experience. And it was, it was basically one of those things that Bill Clinton was so extraordinary about is just all hands on deck. We had as our chief of staff, Leon Panetta, also a Californian who had just run before that job, the Office of Management and Budget, and had been the budget 
uh, chair of the House of Representatives. So boy, he knew he knew how to get money out and get it deployed and get it out there fast. Literally within 60 days, we were able to get some of those uh, freeways, bri- bridges rebuilt, freeways repaired, and we made uh, decisions on the ground. I don't know how deep you want to get in this, but decisions yeah. on the ground, on the fly, that just that just got assistance and aid to people much more quickly than would otherwise have been uh, have been the case. And I think it ended up, to be honest with you, being a very very positive story, not just for the federal government and the role it played, but also for Governor Pete Wilson uh, and the State Emergency Operations Center, and for Mayor uh, Richard Reardon, Dick Reardon in. Uh, in the city of L.A. I mean, the cooperation between Reardon, Wilson, Pena, Witt, Panetta, yourself, I mean, it really did create a model not only for the many natural disasters that followed during the eight years of the Clinton presidency, but the the administrations that followed. And, you know, we have seen sometimes when all of the cooperation has not gelled in that way, but this administration learned a lot from those that critical few days in the weeks that followed. Well, you know, I'll tell you that this is the benefit of of Bill Clinton having been a governor and having been a governor for a long time. He understood as a governor, you could have a tornado, you could have a hurricane, you could have an earthquake, you could have any number of natural disasters, and you want to have the ability to respond to that and help people as quickly as possible. Let's fast forward now, because in all of the intervening experience that you've had, you started in California and you returned to California after your time in Berlin. Jerry Brown, as the 34th and 39th governor, led the state for 16 years and seven days, succeeded now by Gavin Newsom. There are many New York Stock Exchange listed companies headquartered in your state, Chevron, Wells Fargo, Disney, Intel, just to name some of the largest With a population of 40 million people, give us a quick state of the state as we begin the Newsom years compared to where it was when Dick Reardon was looking at the at the highway and was broken. Well, you know, one reason Bill Clinton won California in 1992 was California was in a recession. You know, the California economy had been humming in large part because of President Reagan's massive buildup, military buildup, which a lot of people credit with helping to end the Cold War. And a lot of that money went to California. Southern California was sort of the, the place where aerospace uh, really was based. And then with the fall of the wall, and that began to fall off. And then you had several other dynamics occur simultaneously. California was in a severe recession. And we had the riots. We had the Rodney King riots in the spring of 1992. So when you look at where California was then, and on top of that, fires and floods and earthquakes and all that, and coming out of a recession to where it is today, it's a pretty extraordinary journey. And and California is now either the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. Jerry Brown, when he came in uh, eight, nine years ago, I guess it is now, as governor, there was a massive deficit. He turned it around to his last year, there was about a $20 billion surplus. And that money is put away for a rainy day fund. But it's a a very extraordinary success story. And of course, Silicon Valley and the amazing uh, growth and and success of, of that and the tech world and the internet all of that has uh, is an important piece of it. Uh, but you know what? Manufacturing is starting to come back to California uh, as well. So here we are, a high-tax state, kind of place that normally – maybe economists would look at and say, well, this state, you got 40 million people, you've got terrible homelessness problems, you got very, very high taxes. You know, this is a recipe for disaster. And we're still growing, we're still thriving. And I'd say the one negative thing about California from then to now is our school systems, our public school systems, if anything, have gotten worse. And that is that's a huge danger, not just for the California economy, but for the national economy. And I, I know there's a lot of focus on that, both from Governor Newsom and from uh, from from our local, uh, some, some of the school superintendents. And we actually have a pretty good charter school movement out there as well. So we mentioned at the beginning of the show, John, that you do have a connection with New York City. You grew up in New Jersey. Your grandfather, Presbyterian minister John Sutherland Bunnell was the pastor of the Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church here in the city. He would reach, I think, three million radio listeners with his talks on ABC Network beginning in 1943, lived to be 99. What are your memories of hearing him on the radio? Well, he uh, I'm named after him. I'm John Bonnell Emerson, actually. That's what the B stands for. 
And I, he baptized me at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church. He really he was there for 26 years, and it was an extraordinary time. The New York Times actually had a Monday religion section where they'd cover his sermon and also the sermons of Harry Emerson Fosdick at Riverside, Norman Vincent Peale at Maribel Collegiate, Stephen S. Wise, uh, who was the kind of leading um, uh, rabbi at the time, and uh, Francis Cardinal Spellman at, at St. Patrick's Cathedral. You know, he was always a larger-than-life person. He was large anyway. He was about 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, a, a very big man. Youngest of 10 kids who had a sixth grade education, grew up on Prince Edward Island, Canada, worked in a mental institution, and a fellow who was there who was a genius, but also, uh, you know, sadly had struggled with mental illness, really, in effect, homeschooled my grandfather, went over and fought in World War I, and he had one of those, you know, famous pocket watch that saved his life stories. I mean, I, we actually, the family has the pocket watch. Uh, mortar shell exploded. The two people on either side of him were killed. And he ended up and woke up the next day in a hospital feeling like someone took a sledgehammer to his stomach. But that pocket watch really did save his life. And he, you know, started out as a circuit pastor with uh, small churches and ultimately in the, in the age 42 comes to take Fifth Avenue and really built that into uh, an iconic, uh, certainly at the time, church in uh, the United States of America. And so hearing him on the radio, he was friends of presidents, friends of ambassadors, friends with, uh, he'd met Churchill several times. He wrote uh, a book called uh, Bombs Over Britain. He was asked by the government to go there in the late 1930s. As, as you know, FDR was concerned about us doing everything we could to help and and came back and preached sermons and spoke on the radio about what was happening in Britain at that time. Of course, this is before we got into the war, 3940, that time frame. He was a pretty extraordinary man and very much a larger-than-life figure in my life. And courageous, too, at the time that Joe McCarthy was crusading against sort of the the potential communist influence in religion. He really spoke up and spoke directly to power. He did, and it, it was so funny because I'd never heard this story, and Grandpa was not shy about sharing his stories with us. But uh, we watched a TV show, so my friends in, in law school and I, called Tail Gunner Joe. It was done by the same people who did Missiles of October, which was sort of the first real dr dramatization of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, this was about Joe McCarthy. And there's a scene where a guy bursts into the Oval Office and he says, Mr. President, this time he's gone too far. He, he basically said all Protestant clergy are communist or something like that. And I have this telegram. He read the telegram and it was signed by, I believe, uh, Theodore Hesburgh of Notre Dame, a prominent rabbi, it might've been Stephen S. Wise and John Sutherland Bonnell. And I'm like, oh, my God, Gramps. I mean, so I called him up, and I said, why didn't you ever tell us that story? He said, well, because the president you know, asked me to keep it confidential. I was like, well, how did it get out? But in any event, uh, apparently the story is a good one, because what happened was he and Eisenhower were trading calls, and Eisenhower, here, here's, our, here's our chance. And that, of course, as you would imagine, being in the White House, that telegram went back and forth and was drafted in a way that it could be used most effectively by the president because he sure wanted to come after McCarthy as well. So a, a great story and a, and a, and a wonderful uh, piece of our family lore that I would have had no idea about but for that uh, presentation uh, in Taylor or Joe. So you head up to college upstate in Hamilton. You get your law degree at the University of Chicago. You head west to practice law in L.A., and eventually find yourself among the young cohort challenging party establishment by backing Gary Hart over Walter Mondale in 1984. Let's listen to Peter Jennings, David Brinkley, and Senator Hart as the votes were coming in for Super Tuesday, early 1984. Well, um, I think we did very well. This is, uh, we, we showed up in three major regions of the country, two northern industrial states, a major southern state, and some western states. How did you like it when... Uh this AFL-CIO began talking about where's the beef. <laughs> nice, a nice big fat hamburger roll, but no beef. Well, I... What, what do you I, say to... I showed the beef last night in Mobile, Alabama, actually. I had two buns and a copy of my book. The book is 176 pages long, and it's got a lot of beef in it. And what I said was that I think a lot of people don't like that beef or can't digest it because it's, uh, it's not grown on special interest cattle. Senator, a lot of our exit polls show that you have the least amount of strength tonight among people who are looking for experience and who are looking for stability in a crisis. Now, that's a very important vote come November. What can you do to overcome that? Well, we have however many months there are, eight or ten, 
uh, for me to, uh, for this campaign to settle down and get into some very serious discussions about the depth and breadth of our commitment and our policies on arms control, on approach uh, to foreign policy, not just east and west, but north and south, international economics, uh, economic redevelopment here at home. Can I interrupt for a second? I mean, John, thinking about all those issues that Senator Hart just rattled off, how would our country and our world maybe be different today if Gary Hart had taken on President Reagan instead of Vice President Mondale? Well, I mean, that presumes that he would have been president. But I will tell you, I think it would be a lot better off. And and this is a guy who in the early 1980s, and this is part of why I was attracted to him, he said, look, let's quit fighting about how to cut up the pie. Let's figure out how to make the pie grow. He was the first uh, politician of note to actually talk about the hollowing out of our manufacturing base in large part because of technological advances. And uh, he was sort of ridiculed by some, I think others didn't see it as a ridicule, but called an Atari Democrat because because he was, you know, so focused on the kind of technological advances, but also on taking care of the people who are going to inevitably lose their jobs during this. This you could you could trace that all the way to the Trump revolution. In effect, he was the first one to really talk openly about the environment and climate. And he also talked about, uh, he was very well known for his military reform ideas and, uh, and the concern of spilling blood in, uh, in the Middle East because of our dependence on foreign oil and the need to move away from that. So he was really, uh, uh, Maureen Dowd wrote a piece on, on him. You know, there's a movie that came out about the, the, the campaign a, a year or so ago. I'm Tommy actually, Dewey played you. Yeah, he did. He's much better looking than I am, so nobody knows it's me. But anyway, but he did a great job. Maureen Dowd wrote a piece on it and she uh, on interviewed Gary before the movie and she said he's sort of a Nostradamus. He can see around corners and of course sitting here uh, just blocks away from ground zero, it was Gary Hart and Warren Rudman who chaired the terrorism commission that Bill Clinton and and Secretary Cohn of the uh, Secretary of Defense put together in the late 1990s that in effect predicted a massive attack led by Osama bin Laden on American soil. Losing Gary from, and this is, I think, maybe part of the message of that movie, uh, it's called The Front Runner by Jason Reitman, is that, uh, you know, losing him for what happened, which was probably quaint by today's standards, was a loss for the United States of America because he was a great public servant. Just a month ago, we had at our house a gathering of some of the old heart crew with Gary and with Hugh Jackman to really inaugurate a Gary Hart Center at uh, Denver Metropolitan University to or, to try to get young people involved, not just in politics, but in public service much more broadly spent. And that, I think, would be, let me tell you, there were a lot of people in the Clinton White House in those early days who were veterans of the, of the Hart years. And um, uh, and those two heart campaigns, 84 and, and the one that ended in 87. That was sort of my baptism in politics. And I, uh, I'll i tell you, I was uh, really quite fortunate to have the opportunity to work with him. So you had great role models and mentors. They go back to your grandfather, John Sutherland Bonnell, your father, George McGovern, Gary Hart, Bill Clinton. And it all adds up to where you find yourself in the 2012 campaign. So John, John Quincy Adams was our first minister at the U.S. legation in Berlin, 1797 to 1801. You followed a long line of distinguished Americans in Bonn and then Berlin after World War II, taking over from Phil Murphy. Talk to me about your preparation for this job, the modern selection process, confirmation, and ultimately training for a political appointee to present his or her credentials to our most important allies. First of all, just to, for the listeners to know, we're a little bit unusual in our country in that 30% of our ambassadors tend to be non-career folks. They could be former senators, governors, people from, from government. Uh, I, I was probably my, you know, there in large part because of my past government service. They could be business people. They could be academics. Or they could just be a friend of the president. I mean, sometimes in people who have been involved in the campaign. So you get, you know, all sorts of those. 70% of the ambassadors, though, are career foreign service. And I will tell you, for those of us who are non-career, we come into these jobs knowing we've got an awful lot to learn from the extraordinary non-career people who are there. By the same token, hopefully we have something to offer and something to bring to the table as well. So uh, it, during my period of time in presidential personnel for, for in the first year of Clinton, 
the Clinton White House, I took the leading role in selecting our ambassadors. And, and so I had a sense of what was important. And one thing that's important is the ability of someone to draw a connection to the country in which they're interested in serving. And so I was approached by the Obama administration after the 2012 campaign. Is this something you'd be interested in? And I said, yeah, depending on where. Obviously, it's a big dislocating effort for our whole family. I, you know, I'll a daughter about to start college and identical twins going into 11th grade at that point. And they said, well, tell us where. And I put Germany at the top of the list, both because I thought it was interesting, but also I had a connection. I'd taken the language in high school and college. I uh, had been over to Germany as part of a young leaders program in my mid-30s. I had uh, been there several times uh, beyond that. And I also knew I'd done a lot of work on trade in both the Clinton White House and then in the first term I'd been part of President Obama's trade negotiations and advisory council. And so I knew that the TTIP negotiation was going to be a big piece of the uh, economic uh, issue. And then also, candidly, being with Capital Group, an international investment management firm, gave me a, uh, I wouldn't say a fluency, but certainly a pretty good understanding of some of the a broader business and international economic issues that you would deal with in a country like Germany. So, so that that was sort of the argument as to why. And and fortunately, the president agreed and and put me in that position. So then the question is, what do you do in terms of training? Well, once you go through the vetting process, which by the way is miserable. You know, you're filling out documents about you know like uh, who did you borrow lunch lunch money from in elementary school type of thing. I mean, it's very very detailed. Every foreign trip you've taken in the last 15 years, why, who you went with, who you met, who do you keep in touch with, so on and so forth, all that stuff, mostly geared towards trying to understand if you can be flipped, you know, if you could, you have vulnerabilities that could be exploited by one of our enemies, as an example. But in any event, you get through the vetting process, you pass all the ethical hurdles, then you go to what we are sardonically referred to as charm school. And that's about a three-week course. And uh, it, that's, in effect, you're learning the ins and outs of the State Department, you know, how embassies work. Uh, you know, I had 2,000 members of Mission Germany and five consulates uh, and the largest consulate in the world in, in our consulate in Frankfurt, which served as the back office for other embassies in Europe and Africa. So there's a lot to learn there. And then you go through a couple of months of what we call consultations. And those are typically meetings of an hour, an hour and a half, in the intelligence community, at the White House, in the State Department, every element of the State Department, over at the Pentagon, at the Department of Commerce, at the Department of Treasury, particularly on issues where your posting are gonna touch. So because Germany was a NATO member, because it was an EU member, a lot of, of, of NATO EU issues. And in a way, this is like studying for a final exam, and your final exam is actually your confirmation hearing. And, and so you then go into your confirmation hearing having had this almost drinking from a fire hose. And all that being said, when you get over there, you realize how little you know. And, and there's so many people uh, in the government to meet, understanding the nuances of different relationships. And, but you, you know, the good news is uh, being trained as a lawyer, uh, having been worked in the White House, you uh, have to develop an ability to be a pretty quick study. And that fortunately, I, I think was helpful to me. I mean, shortly before you arrived in Berlin, President Obama visited June 2013. And in front of the Brandenburg Gate, he said this. Well, thank you, Chancellor Merkel, for your leadership, your friendship, and the example of your life. From a child of the East to the leader of a free and united Germany. Uh, as I've said, uh, Angela and I don't exactly look like previous German and American leaders. But the fact that we can stand here today along the fault line where a city was divided, speaks to an eternal truth. No wall can stand against the yearning of justice, the yearnings for freedom, the yearnings for peace that burns in the human heart. I mean, no American president, no German chancellor had looked like Merkel and Obama. What are your particular 
sensitivities about being our representative to a country with whom we've fought two world wars in the past century, gradually rebuilding relations through the chancellorships of Adenauer, Braun, Schmidt, Kohl, Schroeder, and now Merkel? Uh, well, first of all, uh, just pause and think about how eloquent Barack Obama was there. I mean, it was just an extraordinary honor and privilege to represent him uh, and the administration and the entire country uh, in Germany. And there are several things that become very clear, and you can read about them in books and people can tell you about but when you're on the ground, is the deep... Uh, visceral relationship that most Germans, particularly Germans who grew up in the West during the Cold War, and, and now everyone, feel towards the United States of America. You defeated us, but then you came in and you rebuilt us. You taught us about freedom. You taught us about democracy. And uh, you taught us about a free press. And uh, and you've worked with us and been our partner. That's why it hurt them so much when they thought we were spying mm-hmm. on them. And, and by the way, that's part of why uh, I think there are challenges now to mm-hmm. the to the relationship. Uh, this was uh, – it, it's, it's the most – important relationship, I think, to particularly Germans who grew up during the period of the Cold War, or not too many of them are left from the period of the Third Reich, but it's the most important relationship that they that they see. And I used to say that, that our alliance with Germany was an indispensable relationship. And I, it, for sure it was then, and I believe that it is today and will continue to be in the future. I, I also wear the hat as the chairman of the American Council on Germany now. So, uh, But I'm not just saying that because of that role. I, I honestly believe that it was an honor. It was a different kind of role than, say, an ambassador to Russia would have or an ambassador to, uh, to China to be with, uh, or even an ambassador to France, where sometimes there's some complexities in, in that. But we, and there were things we were pushing Germany about. We wanted them to get more involved uh, in taking a bigger role militarily. You know, we were uh, able to get Germany to provide the lethal aid to the Kurdish Peshmerga when we basically outsourced the ground game against ISIS to them. And, and Germany stepped up and did that and played an important role there in the effort to degrade and defeat ISIS and, and did that beautifully. But there were other places where we were pushing. We were pushing on some of the issues that President Trump is uh, talking about. We were pushing them on burden sharing and playing a bigger role. We got them to agree to the 2% you know, of GDP commitment on NATO. We're obviously working hard with them to get a free trade agreement through the EU that would level the playing field in terms of manufacturing, automobiles, and that kind of thing. And and we are also encouraging them, particularly during the Greek financial crisis, you guys need to be investing more in the southern tier of Europe. And you know, Germans, they want that balanced budget. And so that was something else we were pushing against. So it's it's not like we were just over there singing kumbaya all the time. We had our issues, but our issues were always in the context of an understanding that this is one of the handful of most important bilateral relationships we have with any country on the planet, and that at the end of the day, uh, on 99 out of 100 things, this is a country that stands with us with our values, uh, our shared values, and our shared commitment to democracy and human right and freedom around the world. And it was a great honor. And, and I will also tell you, I am a huge fan of Angela Merkel. I had the privilege of having dinner with her uh, about a month ago when she came to New York for the UNGA meetings. And her ambassador to the UN, Christoph Hoiskin, is uh, a dear friend. He was her national security advisor during the time when both Phil Murphy and I were were there. And, uh, and, and in fact, he invited both Phil and me to that dinner. She's an extraordinary person, an extraordinary leader, and I think will go down in history as one of the great ones. I mean, few people have as much insight into Mrs. Merkel as you do. Her singular force, she's now been in office for 14 years lived in East Germany from her infancy to her entrance in politics when the wall came down in 1989. This followed her training and doctorate in quantum chemistry and her work as a research scientist. In an age when most leaders last less than a decade on the world stage, what's been her staying power? I think it's, um, as much as anything, it's her, her sensible pragmatism. And uh, she's not really ideological. She's about you know wh- what what works, how we can move, how we can move things forward. She's not afraid to take bold action. I mean, the en- energy vendor, the uh, you know, folk move away from nuclear and to uh, renewables. That was a big deal, and and a lot in in some parts of Germany, still unpopular. Uh, but she's not afraid to do that. But I think there was a sense of she's steady. 
She's solid. She knows what she's doing. She's thoughtful. She doesn't react impulsively. And that gives, uh, I, I think, particularly Germans, a sense, of, uh, a sense of comfort. You know, the one negative thing that happened, of course, when I was there was the whole immigration crisis and her Wir schaffen das, which was effectively, hey, we can handle this. We have a, we have a human rights catastrophe occurring on our border. We do need to let these people in. People confuse that with, oh, she invited a million and a half people in. No, she actually didn't. She was trying to deal with a catastrophe on the border and, and, and did deal with that. And by the way, if you look at Germany today, a lot of those people, a lot of them have been sent back, but many of them, the refugees who came in are working. They're contributing to the German economy. Germany has a demographic problem in that it's a growing old a society that's growing older. They need uh, some of these younger workers. And and they have been able to honor Wir Schaffendas. But boy, at the time, there's no question that that immigration surge provided rocket fuel for AFD, the alternative for Deutschland, which is the sort of the right wing party uh, that got into the Bundestag this uh, this last time. But uh, even even with that, she she's someone I think people have great confidence is is going to do the right thing. And um, uh, I'll tell you something else about her. She's got a great sense of humor. You know, people don't necessarily see that in, in terms of her public uh, uh, dealings, but she's got a great sense of humor. She's extremely warm and uh, and just, uh, I mean, a terrific person on top of that. I mean, you were in your post when the Brexit referendum went down June 23rd, 2016, right here at the New York Stock Exchange. The Dow was down nearly 900 points over the course of two days. And from someone in your position, it can't have been a complete surprise. I want to hear... Speaking of Chancellor Merkel's sense of humor, maybe a dry sense of humor, here she is in London speaking before the British Parliament, February 2014. I've been told many times during the last few days that there are very spe special expectations of my speech here today. <laughs> Supposedly, or so I have heard, some expect my speech to pave the way for a re fundamental reform of the European architecture, which will satisfy all kinds of alleged or actual British wishes. I'm afraid they are in for a disappointment. <laughs> I've also heard that others are expecting the exact opposite and are hoping that I will deliver the clear and simple message here in London that the rest of Europe is not prepared to pay almost any price to keep Britain in the European Union. I'm afraid these hopes will be dashed, too. These hopes certainly dashed. The referendum goes down. John, how does President Obama, Senator Kerry, and ultimately someone like Ambassador John Emerson react to what it seems overnight a changed world order? Well, I'll tell you, you know, President Obama and Secretary Kerry both were made it very, very clear in the UK, in Europe, that uh, they thought this was a bad idea and were concerned about it. You know, the interesting thing, immediately there was a real, again, Germans react more emotionally than people normally think. You know, I think they think of Southern Europeans as being emotional. Germans can be emotional. There was this sort of emotional reaction of, you don't want to be with us anymore. I mean, you know, Germany likes being parts of a group of nations doing things. They did tried the other way, it didn't work out too yeah. well. And and so there was real concern and great anxiety, and I think that, you know, anxiety was probably shared at the highest levels of our government that oh my gosh, is this the first brick out of the wall of European integration? Are we going to see a Nexit in the Netherlands? Are we going to see a Grexit? Are we going to see a Frexit with Le Pen in France? Are we going to see an Italy? And in point of fact, one of the silver linings of this whole Brexit process is it's been such a horror show that no other countries, none of the other 27 remaining member states of the European Union are interested in going in that direction. And so I think that's a bit of a silver lining. The second silver lining is the 27 member states actually came together. They came together and they weren't fighting at cross purposes and it was sort of, okay, UK, you figure out what you want. You come to us with a proposal. We're not gonna negotiate against ourselves. And when you're ready to talk, then we'll talk. And the the proof in the pudding of, of all this, you know, kind of moving to a more positive place is if, my guess is if you were to have asked Angela Merkel, uh, and at the time, I guess it was Francois Hollande, you know, and Renzi, Prime Minister Renzi of Italy, name the top five items on their worry list, 
Brexit would have been number one. Today, number five, number six. You know, so I think the, they're they're dealing with it now quite well. But there's no question there was a lot of anxiety, particularly on the ground in Germany when it when it happened. There was also a little Schadenfreude. I was at a party watching the European Cup at the time, somebody's house, and there were about a hundred people there. And this is when Iceland beat England. Okay, and and so some of the Germans. This was about three days after the Brexit vote. They go well. Well, I guess we're having a Brexit out of the European Cup. Uh, you know, so a little schadenfreude there. I don't, I don't think too many people were rooting for England in that tournament uh, sitting in Germany. You were the 2015 recipient of the State Department's Susan B. Cobb Award for Exemplary Diplomatic Service given annually to the non-career ambassador who used private sector leadership and management skills to make a significant impact on bilateral or multilateral relations through proactive diplomacy. So I'm curious, John, you mentioned your work in Capital Group, your work in the White House Personnel Office, you know, all the things leading up to your appointment. What skills do you think you brought to the job once you were there, both from government and business, which might have otherwise been hard to find among those whose careers stay squarely within the diplomatic ranks? Well, first of all, it was a great honor uh, for me to receive that award. I mean, they, you know, I said 30 percent of us are non-career. That's about 65 or 70 ambassador ranked people around the around the globe. And, you know, one one of those gets it every year, which is really so it was a real honor to get it. With the other thing I appreciate is there's always tension that the press plays up between the career people and the non-career but why are these donors getting ambassadorial posts the people who nominate you for this and the people who ultimately select it are the career folks so you really almost feel like um i i'm getting respect from the people i would most want to get respect from in this world and i think the you know, just to go back for what skills, I mean, I think the reason I got this was, number one, the way we handled the aftermath of the whole cell phone disclosure situation and rebuilding the Intel relationship, and then also what I was trying to do in terms of the TTIP negotiations. And there, one of the roles I played for President Clinton was I ran the war room to get the Uruguay round of the GATT through agreement through Congress. And interestingly enough, there was a young White House fellow who was assigned to that war room by Bob Rubin. His name is Michael Froman. Michael then became my boss as the U.S. trade representative, and, and I was sort of his wingman as we were not just relating to Germany, but also the two of us did some tag team presentations to the rest of the European ambassadors when we were back at the State Department a couple of times on how do you build domestic political support for a complicated trade agreement. And I think that was something that, I don't know if it was private sector or public sector, but the the ability to speak to businesses, to help mobilize business community, to support this agreement was probably also part of why I got it. But I mean, a lot of it's just... Um, you know, your own judgment and how you, how you live your life and, and how you respond to situations. But I, I, I will t- tell you, I was very uh, deeply honored to get that award. When we come back, more with Ambassador John Emerson on the future of Germany, relations with the United States, and what happens when an emissary finally has to give up his sash. That's right after this. And now a word from ICE's global head of oil sales and market. Across global oil markets, the shell revolution and Asian demand have shifted trade flows. New regulations are impacting our customers. IMO 2020 completely changes shipping economics. We offer the most liquid global crude and refined markets with regional pricing across the barrel. Built on Brent, Dubai, and Permian TI, our crude complex offers critical risk management tools. Around 75% of OI and derivatives of oil benchmarks is held at ICE. In refined products, gas oil is the global benchmark, with pricing points all over the world. Designed for the commercial trader, ICE offers a truly global oil product suite. Back now with former ambassador to Germany and now chairman of Capital Group International, John B. Emerson. So, John, I don't know what your thoughts might have been about your future on the night in the United States of November 8th, 2016. 
I know where I was. I was at the Javits Center. I don't know if you came back for Election Day or you were in Germany for it, but was it a surprise? Where were you at the time? Well, it, it's uh, interesting. I mean, one of the roles that an ambassador plays in the run-up to a presidential election, which pretty much if, if you're serving for the full term of a president, you're always going to have, is explaining what's happening in our country to the host country. And let's just say, and you know, I mean, the good news is with my background in presidential politics and a number of different campaigns, I, I, this was an area I was very comfortable with, but it was almost like I was an analyst. And just as we went through the primary process, as we went through the debates, and after every major event, we would do something comparable to the list, to this, you know, an interview at the embassy that would then be sent out, put online, what have you, about what does this mean, what has happened. And um, on election night, we had two parties simultaneously that the embassy was a co-sponsor of, each of which had 2,000 people at it. I mean, just huge interest in Germany to the uh, uh, on this. You know, a ton of press at both places, and I went and spoke at both events. And uh, don't forget, the polls wouldn't cl- start closing until 2 a.m., you know, German time. So this was going on well past midnight. And people would ask me, they would say, well, you must feel uh, pretty good, you know, because obviously they knew while I was completely nonpartisan and analytical in the way I would describe things, they knew my background. They knew I was close to the Clintons. Oh, you must be excited. And I, I just said, let me just tell you something. This election is going to be extraordinarily close. And by no means is it a foregone conclusion that Hillary Clinton will win. And they'd say, what? Why? I say, well, She's only two to three points up in the polls. And I can tell you, most of that, those numbers are going to be in places like New York and California. And the, as far as I can tell, the swing states are tight. And I said, to be honest with you, the fact that she went to Michigan and Pennsylvania on the day before the election is a bad sign, because those are states that should be in the wheelhouse. She, you know, normally you'd think she'd be going to Florida and, and North Carolina right before the election. So there were sort of signals that, uh, and th- that I expressed to the press and the people there. But then on, at once the polls closed, I wanted to be in effect by myself, not literally by myself. I mean, Kimberly was, uh, was there, invited. Uh, we became very good friends with the bureau chief of the New York Times, uh, Alison Smale, who's now here as uh, spokesperson for the UN. In any event, we uh, invited her and her husband and I think one other friend to sit with us as we, I just did get me a room somewhere uh, where I can watch the polls. And and you could tell, having lived through this, I could tell pretty quickly that things weren't going to be going in a, uh, a surprising direction. And so uh, I then at uh, 6 a.m. started making the rounds of the press. This had all been set up. I literally was doing live television commentary and radio in Germany until about one in the afternoon. And then um, David Weston asked me to come on Bloomberg to talk about what are the implications of this overseas. And I did that for about half an hour uh, at that point in time. I felt my responsibility as ambassador, uh, as much as obviously I, you know, close to Hillary Clinton and was extremely, you know, upset and concerned about the election, I felt my responsibility is to try to calm everybody down about Mm -hmm. this election. And so that was the tone that I took. And I, I said, look, you know, people say things during campaigns once they get in the White House, once they learn the facts about a situation, they often will change positions. They they kind of tone down the combative rhetoric, things like that. And and I tried to, I, I made the point that, you know, look, there are a lot of things that, you know, we knew from the campaign that there's going to be disagreement with Germany on, for instance, COP21, the Paris Climate Change Agreement. We knew there was going to be a disagreement on the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, uh, and several other things. I said, look, there are going to be disagreements that we haven't had. The trade, mm-hmm. the trade relationship was going to be somewhat different. Uh, you know, he'd made it clear he wasn't, had a, no interest in pursuing the TTIP or the TPP negotiations. And so I said, you know, there may be differences government to government, but you've got the business to business relationship, which is hugely important. I made the point that this is an administration that will probably want to um, be winding, you know, pulling back regulations, try to cut red tape, make it easier for companies to invest in the United States, which actually had been a priority of Bill Clinton and George W. Bush and uh, Barack Obama. He has immediate ancestry in Germany. He has bankers in Germany. I mean, he has a lot of connections. Yeah, I didn't know about the bankers at that point, but I actually did talk about 
about the ancestry. Well, let's just say that the concerns that a lot of Germans had about the election have been more than realized if you step back and, and look at it and look at, look at where we are today. Uh, but I also, I'll tell you this, and this fits with my role as chairman of the American Council on Germany. I talked about the importance of the people-to-people relationship. You know, there's 65 million Americans that have German heritage. Yeah. Then the business-to-business relationship continues. You know, BMW now makes more cars over here than it does in Bavaria, and it's Bavarian Motor Works. VW is planning, uh, they built a huge, during my tenure, a, a factory in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I worked with Senator Corker on that, and they uh, are going to make all their E, their electric vehicles there, is, is what they want to do. So, I mean, you know, there's a, Siemens has 60,000 employees in the United States of America. So the I try to get people to understand that the relationship is a lot bigger and broader than simply how do the two leaders of the governments get get along. I mean, you've got an effect at that point in November and then December and January, your own transition. You go from what would probably have been a friendly handover to someone you probably would have known to eventually a year later, Rick Grinnell. We do know how the transition between Barack Obama and Donald Trump went down one meeting and they've never spoke since. But what did you do to establish continuity with the next person in the post? Well, President Obama was clear. He wanted everybody in his administration to do everything they could to make for a very smooth transition. And that was something that that, that President Bush had done for him, and he wanted to do the same for his successor. And so we all put together, uh, you know, papers, analysis of what are the top issues, where are we, et cetera. They're doing that at the State Department, doing it uh, at Post. Now, on election night, I did say to Kimberly, we need to cancel our Christmas vacation because I'm sure we'll be leaving on January 20th and we need to start uh, our whole, you know, farewell process. And now what normally happens in, obviously, if it was a, a president of the same party, I probably would have stuck around through July, which is when the, the G20 was slated to happen in Hamburg. And that kind of would have been my swan song. But even though there's a change in administration, what Bush did for Clinton people and what Obama did for Bush people is you typically, you don't tell them you got to be out on January 20th. You, you say, stick around for another month or two, do your proper farewells. And by the way, if you have kids in school, let's talk. Uh, Maybe it'll be appropriate for you to stay through the end of the school year. Mm -hmm. Bob Kimmett, one of my predecessors, who was George H.W. Bush's ambassador to Germany, when Bill Clinton uh, came in as president and Warren Christopher as secretary of state, Bob Kimmett had kids in school. He stayed as ambassador until the summer of uh, 1993, as an example. And so That's normally what happens. And then when you come back, come to the State Department. We'll have most of our senior people in place. You can brief us. Often there was a reception at the State Department for returning ambassadors. Anyway, uh, needless to say, none of that happened here. It was, and and that was my instinct, was just that there had been enough hostility in the campaign that um, he's going to want everybody out of there. And by the way, I felt I couldn't in good faith what had I been talking about? Negotiating the TTIP, getting the Iran nuclear deal done, getting the COP21 uh, signed and, and, and approved, uh, you know, a whole host of issues that I knew the administration had diametrically opposed positions on. It wouldn't have been right for me to, uh, what I say, you know, everything I've been saying about X, Y, and Z, never mind. So I was perfectly fine with our departure. But I must say, when you're moving a family of five and a dog and you know, all the household goods, and then you're trying to get around a large country with five consulates and and touch all the bases. It was a pretty frenetic 10 weeks. So a few months, maybe earlier than you planned, how do you personally, you and Kimberly, reestablish your footing in California? Was a return to Capital Group always in your plan? Well, it was actually something that we talked about when I left. You know, I had to retire, but there was, a you know, discussions that, well, well, who knows where we'll all be in three or four years, but it's something we'd certainly talk about. It wasn't like I was leaving to go for a competitor. And so once it became clear that I'd be leaving and when, I, I actually set up a meeting with a couple of my friends who were very you know senior folks in the organization for uh, late January when I knew I would return and we, and we started having the conversation. You know, mainly you're, like I said, 10 weeks to 
unwind all this is a, uh, you know, that's a tall order. And so, and, and our kids, by the way, it was great because they, our, our twins did 11th grade, 12th grade at an international school and then a gap year in Germany where they worked on an organic farm. They worked at Babelsberg Film, Film Studios, some other things, all unpaid internships and had an extraordinary period of time. Our oldest daughter, who started at Stanford literally a month after we arrived at Post, but Stanford has a Berlin campus. So she got to come back and, and go to school there during her junior part of her junior year they all felt deep connections to germany and i guess the so what happened was they came back obviously for the christmas holidays and then they wanted to stay through that period so they both all three of them missed uh, the first couple of weeks of return to college but it was so important for them to be a part of all that so we uh uh, we did that. And by the way, uh, Kimberly and I felt uh, such a connection to the country and so many friends. We actually got an apartment in Berlin during 2016. And uh, when I go back and travel there for work, that's where I, uh, that's where I stay on the, during the weekends. So, John, you and Kimberly are now back in California 2017. Chancellor Merkel visits Washington. And whether it was an obsessive focus on body language, of which I can sometimes fall victim, or a true chilling of relations between the United States and Germany, most obviously over NATO funding, but so many other issues that you've talked about in our conversation so far, the relationship seemed to grow as cold as a missed handshake. Let's take a listen to John Oliver of Last Week Tonight. This was a week of diplomacy for the president, or as it turned out, the opposite of that. <laughs> president Trump hosting Chancellor Angela Merkel at the White House today will be their first face-to-face -face meeting since Mr. Trump ridiculed the chancellor on the campaign trail, accusing her of, quote, ruining Germany. Wow. <laughs> well, first, that is a major insult, because historically, the title of Chancellor synonymous with ruining Germany is pretty much taken. <laughs> and if you are thinking, that Trump made an extra effort to smooth things over, you would be wrong, because watch what happened when the media at a photo op made a very routine request. So, John, earlier this year, Chancellor Merkel said, and I'm going to quote her, there is no doubt that Europe needs to reposition itself in a changed world. The old certainties of the post-war order no longer apply. And that was taken to mean that Europe must consider the United States, along with China and Russia, as rivals in the future. Where do you think things stand? Well, uh, first of all, on that, that John Oliver thing is hysterical. But in point of fact, if you were to ask Merkel and her people, they think Trump got a bum rap on the handshake thing. And the reason is, uh, first of all, he came out to the car to greet her. And that, by the way, was unusual. I mean, that uh, Obama usually greet them when they came to the Oval Office. So he did come out to the car to greet her. And then they had about 30 minutes one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. the two of them. And so their sense, her staff's sense was in the, you know, you've been in there a million times in the Oval when the press scrum is in there for the, these photo ops. It, it, you can't hear yourself think with, a, with a, the cameras clicking and, and all that. And so uh, they actually think he didn't hear her say, let's, let's shake hands. But that being said, um, obviously, it's not the best relationship that she's had with any you know, president. She had very good relationships with Presidents Bush and Obama. But I do think this. I think it's good and important for Europe to take more of a, quit waiting to follow the United States. You know, start thinking seriously about what is in our interest. Where do we need to take a leadership role? Don't wait for the America to lead. Uh, you know, because there is this dynamic of a gravitational pull in terms of pulling back, and we see it reflected in both parties, certainly in the in the policies of the Trump administration. But I think it's important for Europe to begin to think, be more forward-leaning uh, itself. And that's something we were trying to encourage at the same time, obviously with us, but the idea that Europe is going to focus on being a little more forward-leaning as it, as it confronts some of these issues is probably not a bad thing. While you were in Berlin, career ambassador Marie Yovanovitch took up residence in 2016 as our emissary in Kiev. She was recalled earlier this year. She came in at a difficult time. Russia had annexed Crimea. President Poroshenko struggled to fight corruption. And then here comes the new administration with a different set of objectives. Ambassador Bill Taylor is testifying up on Capitol Hill as we sit here and talk today in New York. 
From where you sat in Berlin, what did you make of the mess in Ukraine as you saw it unfold? And as you return to private life, how does any career ambassador's mission change when power shifts in Washington and there's a new secretary of state sending the cables? Well, just to answer that last question first, every one of these career ambassadors, first of all, you don't get to be ambassador until you're well on in your career. They all have served presidents of both parties. And they actually pride themselves, as do the members of the intelligence community, in dutifully serving presidents of both parties. And if there are shifts in policies, implementing those policy shifts, whether or not they might agree with them. Now, they'll clearly let their position be known. But at the end of the day, if we're going in direction, you know, A and their prefer B, they're going to go in direction A and, and follow the lead of the administration. That's why I think it's been so hurtful to so many of the career diplomats and to so many of the career members of the intelligence community uh, to have this sort of sense that they're not trusted or not loyal or what have you. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just want to put that down. As ambassador of Berlin, I actually uh, worked very closely with Jeff Pyatt, who was the her predecessor in uh, in Ukraine. He came in uh, literally at the same time I did. And so we served for three full years together. And then she and I overlapped for a very brief period of time because it was really only about three and a half right. years I was there. He was the lead on Ukraine. And in particular, Toria Newland, who was the Assistant Secretary of State for Europe, who was was really the lead on Ukraine. And my role was to be a wingman where I could in helping to deal with the German government. Because, again, Merkel's leadership through something called the Normandy process, which was France, Germany, uh, Ukraine, and uh, Russia, basically Putin, Poroshenko, uh, Hollande, and Merkel. She was kind of the leader of that effort, which was trying to basically get a uh, a, a diplomatic solution to which, unfortunately, uh, it ultimately didn't, you know, didn't come to success, fruition, but uh, of that situation. The second thing we did was work very closely, and in particular, uh, you know, with, with Toria, but working with Merkel and in particular Christoph Hoiskin, her national security advisor, to get sanctions imposed on Russia through the EU. The EU is a consensus organization. You need every country to sign off on it. And so there was um, interest in having sanctions that we didn't want to see a gap between where the United States of America was and where the EU was. And so we worked very, very closely on, on those matters as well. But that is the proper role for an ambassador, career or non-career, uh, to play when you're, you know, as opposed to supplementing or supplanting the person who has, in fact, been appointed by the president and confirmed by the United States Senate to represent the government, represent the country, represent the people of the United States of America to that country. And we're hearing that uh, maybe that didn't quite happen in this particular case in the last couple of years. There are young people who are going to listen to this podcast who may want to follow in the footsteps of these career foreign service officers after they get out of college. It can make for an extraordinary career, as you've seen firsthand. You wrote over the weekend regarding a piece in foreign policy by Bill Burns that, I'm going to quote your comment, we need to back our talented and experienced diplomats who pride themselves on ably serving presidents on both parties. What's your message to these young people? Maybe you saw some of them when you were on post, and you certainly see them back when you're talking in California to them and your fellow citizens about navigating that path in today's world. Well, first of all, what I would say to them is there are few things that are more rewarding, interesting, exciting uh, than serving your country overseas in in any capacity. But in particular with the with the Foreign Service, you opened the show with a quote from Jim Mattis about you need to buy me more, more ammo if you, un, you know, if you hollow out our uh, diplomatic services. And the fact of the matter is diplomacy is really the front line of national security. It's interesting as a foreign service officer, every three years you're moving to a different country. Sometimes you come back to the same country in a, in a different capacity. Sometimes you'll come back to Washington, D.C. But it's extraordinarily interesting and extraordinarily important as well. And you can have a, a very uh, significant long-term impact on, um, 
our national security, on our foreign policy, and on o- overall on really uh, humanity, and, and depending on where you're posted and what the circumstances are. So I would, if you, if any young person has an interest in going in that area, I would absolutely encourage them to do it. Uh, I think it's important. Uh, learning language is important. And by the way, when you get to the State Department, when you get posted to a new country, if you don't know the language, they'll give you a year of a crash course at, at the Foreign po- uh, Service Institute to learn that language. But learning a language is important. Read newspapers, papers like you know The Economist, maybe some uh, non-U.S. papers like The Financial Times to get a sense of uh, other things that are happening around the world. Read books. Uh, I would recommend um, an extraordinary book by George Packer uh, about Richard Holbrook, one of, one of my predecessors. I was going to mention uh, called, Holbrook. Yeah, exactly, which was uh, it, it really, if you want to learn about life as a foreign service, I mean, he talks about when he and Tony Lake, who was the national security advisor when you and I were in the White House, starting out as young FSOs in Vietnam during as that was getting underway. So I'm telling you, it's a, a great thing. And then think about studying international relations, but also think about studying philosophy. Think about studying history. Really important to have a, a historical context for what's happening in the world. The you know, popular line is history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. You know, you'll see our best generals are students of military history, Mattis, as an example. Certainly. Yeah, for sure. John Emerson, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Josh. House. It's a pleasure to be with you again and uh, really enjoyed it. Thanks. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Ambassador John B. Emerson, former United States ambassador to Germany and now vice chairman of Capital Group International. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or a question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at theice.com or tweet at us at icehousepodcast. Our show is produced by Pete Ash and Teresa DeLuca with production assistance from Stephen Romanchik and Ken Abel. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the Library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 